Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Above the Bar podcast, where each week we belly up to the bar with a new guest, find out what they do, who they are, and what makes them great. So sit back, relax, and enjoy. All righty, folks, welcome back to the Above the Bar podcast. It's your host, Sean. We have bellied up to the bar today. We have with us, we're going to just say he's a ruggedly handsome gentleman. He's joined us. He wore, even told me he wore a special shirt for me today. How lucky can I get? He has probably one of the best podcast names that I've heard in a long time. That if it doesn't make you stop and go, well, well son of a gun, I got to figure out what the hell this is all about. I don't think anything under the sun ever would. We, and, and I'm going to butcher his, his name because I spent, spent half the day trying to repeat it to myself and going, I'm not going to mess this up. Devannon. Perfect. See that? I knew I spent all day for a good reason. We are joined by the host, creator, everything else under the sun of sex, drugs, and Jesus, Mr. Devannon Hubert. Look at that. You even get applause and everything. <laughs> How are you there, good sir? I live for the applause, applause, applause. <laughs> <laughs> That's like my fa- one of my favorite memes. So what's the, it goes uh, something about uh, what's your dream job? And, and the woman goes, I do, honey, I've told you I do not dream of labor. <laughs> it's something like that. I love that one. So as we're getting ready to do everything, again, welcome to the show. I think it's fitting to have you on today. Uh, As we always say here at the Above the Bar podcast, uh, no topic is is off limits and everyone is welcome. So I think today being the first day of Pride Month, hearing your story, hearing what you had to go through, I think this is quite fitting. And we didn't plan it this way. I was just looking for an opening for him to come on. And then all of a sudden I'm like, hey, wait a sec. Shit, it's Pride Month. This is perfect. Right. (laughs) Don't get no better. It's, It's like I almost planned it. But trust me, folks. I'm the worst planner that there is. So let's get the bar open. Let's get everything situated so we can get everybody uh, knowing. For those of you that are watching us right now, make sure you share this to all your favorite yard sale sites and everywhere else that you belong to a group on Facebook or wherever you're listening so that they can all go ahead and jump on here and ask questions. As always, please ask questions. Let us know what's going on. First things first, though, I'll move the mic off to the side so everyone can see it. You a football fan? Are you a football fan? On some days. Depends on how hot the guys are. Ah, fair enough. <laughs> fair enough. It's all about the tight pants. I got it. Um, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so we've got our big board for sticker and a cause. If you have something that you believe in, something that you're supporting, make sure you reach out to us on our Facebook our LinkedIn, our YouTube, our Twitter, our Twitch. They're all the above the bar podcast, even our Parent Network, Earplug Podcast Network. You can reach out to us there and you can send us an email at the above the bar podcast at gmail.com. You let me know what it is you're supporting, what it is you've got going on. We'll read about it live on the air and we'll put your sticker on the big board so everybody knows what you've got going on and they can support you also. Also, if your media seems like it might be on drugs and you need to get it cleaned up, make sure you reach out to Media by Dibs. That's D-I-B-S. You can find him on Facebook at Media by Dibs, and you can find him on uh, Instagram, Media by Dibs. Our Instagram is the Above the Bar Podcast. I expect that you're already following that. But make sure you reach out to Media by Dibs. And if you go on to LinkedIn, it's Andrew Dibble. And you mention to him, uh, belly up to the bar. He's going to give you a 10% discount on your first media order and a free consultation. The bar is open. It's all done. How are you, Mr. Devannon? I'm... Pretty fantastic. How about yourself? Oh, any, any better would be illegal. So now, now you're, we're talking, I'm in Albany, New York. Where are you at today? Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Ah, uh, I love Louisiana. You guys, have you ever had a snowball in Louisiana? Like you guys in New Orleans are like the only other place besides Baltimore that has snowballs. You talking about like an actual snowball made or one that you eat. Like a snowball from the sky? You're talking about like a snowball? No, 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 not like a snowball from the sky. Like like go and it's the shaved ice with the with the syrup on it. Yeah, we got those here. See, that's the thing. Like you guys and us are in Baltimore, like the only two places 
that I know of that have those. Not Italian ices, not the 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 chipped ice or none of that. I'm talking like out of the machine, you put the syrup on it, and then you put marshmallow fluff on top of it. Well, you kind of have to go to the hood to find shit like that. And so I told Latin you I'm Ru- from Baltimore, bro. Latin Ru- is pretty hood. <laughs> I mean, I told you, brother. I'm from Baltimore. It don't get much hooder than that. Look, see, Carol's over here. My my friend Carol. Carol no one wants a snow cone. That's that thing that like was ho- was a hard as a rock, and the paper used to always like fall apart, and then you suck the juice out of the bottom of them. Do you remember those? Yeah, yeah. We're talking about snowballs. So, tell us where does let's get into this because I can. As soon as you told me you're down there, I love to eat. There's a fat kid that lives in my soul, <laughs> and, and when you talk about Louisiana, that's like one of those food meccas for me. So let's get get into this a little bit. So let's talk about uh, where does the show name come from? I love your show name. I, I'm I really do. Well, thank you, man. I appreciate that. So, Sex Drugs and Jesus came about while I was writing the memoir, and in my book, there's a huge, uh, oh, an overarching theme of sex, and a lot of sex, there's a lot of drugs, and there's a lot of Jesus. And so, I was like, why fuck around with it? Why beat around the bush with the title? Let's just call it what it is. <laughs> and so we have sex, we have drugs. And we have Jesus, and I named the podcast the same thing as I did the book because there was really anything that there were no more relevant topics or titles that I could come up with than that. And, and now you mentioned, you know, because I went back and I don't do a lot. Most people that know me, I try to do as minimal of a research on my guests as possible. And and that's not to be mean because I want to be just as surprised as everybody else is. We're, we're learning about each other and what's going on here. But you i've read that so when did you finally realize your sexuality because you were very heavily you were come from a church family oh i mean i knew i liked men since i was like three you know my dad's friends and my brother's friends were very attractive you know even at that young age so the real thing is when did i accept my sexuality okay so now that's a question hold on now what how do you differentiate the two then because i know knew what my attraction was early on, but then I struggled being raised in the church and then going to the military and all of that caused confusion to come up within me. And as it does so many of my fellow people. So knowing who you are, and then accepting it are two different things. So the church caused the confusion, the self-loathing, the hating of myself and wishing I was someone else and trying to pray the gay away and date girls to become <laughs> trying to date girls to become ungay and all of these things that so many of us go run out and do. How'd that work out for you? Pray away the gay. (laughs) You can't do it. It doesn't work. It It doesn't work. (laughs) Doesn't, doesn't work. There's a documentary on Netflix called pray away. That's all about conversion therapy and how it doesn't work. Yeah. I my, so my best friend and I, we we've talked about those movies and yeah, it's just not, not not functionally does it make any sense, but so so did you ever have now that's a curiosity. Did you ever go through any of that stuff? Like you so you were in the what army, right? I was in the Air Force. Oh, that makes even more sense. Should have been in the Navy, but okay. I did 20 years in the Marine Corps, so it just makes sense. Lots of semen over there. Look, <laughs> nobody you'll see as another prior service member, you'll appreciate this. There is nothing more locker room gay than than our, than the military, we we are we're horrible. We do more locker room games with each other, but the minute somebody's like, "You're gay," you're like, "Shut up, I ain't gay, dude." You just pulled your stuff out and showed somebody, <laughs> like like, what are you talking about? And like, that's not gay. Mm, you wouldn't do it walking down the street, you know. You get arrested for that, yeah. Like, how was that? Now you were during the "Don't Ask, Don't Tear, Tell" era, then also correct. Now, how did you deal like like how did you deal with that knowing in your heart of hearts who you are, who you are as a person? How did you deal with that? Oh, I became a total slut because you know, you, you know, I couldn't <laughs> I could I knew I couldn't <laughs> I'm you know, sorry. I, I couldn't uh no laugh all you want. It's great for the soul and the body and everything, great for your health. Um, you know, I knew I couldn't have a successful, you know, relationship with a guy 
And so therefore at the age of 17, you know, I went to the military and I'm off experimenting as we do at that age. And, you know, gay.com was a thing, you know, back then. And, you know, I knew I would have to move around with the military too. So even having like an undercover long-term relationship was really an impossibility because being in the military is usually a very unstable life. Yes. And so the straight people would like marry quickly whoever they found so that they would always be moving around together. But if you weren't straight, that's a luxury you didn't have. So then I just took all the dick I could. (laughs) Don't hold back for us, man. Don't hold back. I mean, let it out. You be you. Don't hold back. (laughs) Um, And it's, it's funny because I, I've, you know, you mentioned the gay dot, dot com, but I've heard, you know, being in the in the Marine Corps, and I, I got to fix my chair. I got to get a new chair. My freaking hydraulics in my chair keep dropping on me. But um, you've heard, I mean, I remember hearing back as the Internet was kind of first becoming a thing and all that, you know, there was, oh, well, there's secret codes. You, you don't know those codes. And there was websites and then there was an app that told you how close you were to somebody else who had that app. Did you ever use any of those kind of things? Yeah. Once gay.com became a thing of the past and then the app started to come out. So you have your Adam for Adam scruff grinder back then you had like boy ahoy and all kinds. So as the technology, wait, wait a sec. I've, you just named about five. I've heard of grinder. Those other ones I've never even heard of. Boy, ahoy, this like chocolate chip cookie app. What is this? What is this? I don't think they stood the test of time, but each one has their own niche. So <laughs> I couldn't imagine what that one was. I couldn't imagine. If I recall, it was kind of like more Twinkie in nature. Okay. Whereas Scruff is more for like hairy guys and stuff like bear, that. Bear, bears and otters. Bears. Look otters. at this. Um, I, I'm the most aware heterosexual man you know. I just want you to understand that. I, I'm very aware. We're doing a show on Saturday for the opening of a gay bar. We've mm-hmm. had drag queens on the show many a times. So I'm the most aware straight man you've ever met in your life. You know, I knew what bears and otters and shit. <laughs> that. And cubs. Yeah. I and what? Like what? Wait a sec. What? What word? Cubs, bears, cubs, and otters. Oh, cubs. Yeah, I guess I get that one. I don't think I've ever heard that one before, though. Maybe I'm not as aware as I know. So, so you're going through all this, but we're talking, you know, you get into the whole drug piece, you know, you, you go off into the service. Where did we transition from, you know, Hey, yeah, this is who I am. Uh, I'm doing a little undercover brother with it. This I'm keeping, keeping this under wraps the best I can. So others don't know about it, but where does it transition to, you you start to get into the, to the drug addiction side to it. Oh, Lord. Okay, that didn't happen until almost 10 years later. So I didn't do drugs, you know, inhaling the weed and not, I mean, smoking the weed and not inhaling it, you know, pulling a Bill Clinton doesn't count. You know, and I don't <laughs> think weed is a drug anyway. This is the fucking plant. And so, um, so gosh, I was 17 when I was in the military. I got out around 22, 23. So we're talking 2000 to 2006. It wasn't until I was damn near 30 years old that I took that first ecstasy pill. And the only reason that I had devolved, well, for, that, that I decided to do it was because I was rebelling against the, an experience that happened to me when I was at Lakewood Church in Houston, Texas. So I was kicked out of there for not being straight. And so once this happened, it, um, it caused me to become very angry. And so I was raised in church, was an altar boy in the Pentecostal church and volunteering in church my entire life until I got kicked out of Lakewood. And it would be about five or six years before I walked into church again. During that t- gap of time, I was offered drugs as I had been, you know, for so many years. But then now I started saying yes. Everything I used to say no to, I started saying yes to. I was like, fuck it. Why not? And I began to seek community you know, in the nightlife, you know, more in the bars and stuff like that. You know, I was volunteering over 10 hours a week at church. Once that was taken away, I then shifted and filled all of that time with clubbing and nightlife. And I found a community in the streets. Wow. So, so you, I, I want to stay with this for, for a minute. Cause I'm really curious. So, so you, 
you feel you created a community with the military, mm -hmm. got out, didn't have your church community. Now, did you not have the church community when you first got out or you did have it again? No, I did. And I, so I got out of the Air Force when I was in California. And a, one of the main reasons I moved to Houston, Texas, was to go to Lakewood Church because I'm very big on volunteerism and I don't go to churches anymore because I find them to be unnecessary at this point. But um, but no, I went right from right into the church community and I had it up until I was kicked out. And then I shifted into the nightlife. And see, I know now what I didn't know back then, man, was that we seek community in some type of way. We're always going to be looking for it. And I didn't know that. What I should have done once they kicked me out was went and found like a gay affirming church. which I didn't know those existed too much. You know, I didn't know they had denominations where they're totally OK with you. If you're not straight and they don't think you're going to go to hell. Come on, hang and, out with us, Methodists. We're cool that way. We're like the Pepsi one at Catholic. All the same great flavor, just none of the guilt. <laughs> I, you know, I'll swallow that. And so, <laughs> <laughs> and so and so I didn't realize that I was went out there in the night because I used to only go to the club like maybe once or twice a month. And once I got kicked out, I started going every night. And I didn't oh. realize that I was subconsciously trying to find a family again. You were filling that void. Right. I didn't know that then. Um, and, I, you know, I should have went and got me some psychotherapy or something like that because I didn't realize the the trauma that being kicked out of a church for not being straight really does to people. How do they kick you out of the church? Like, like I don't even understand that. That doesn't even register to me. OK, so what had happened was. See, what had happened was. <laughs> I was all like ate up. You know, I was volunteering and I was trying to be on staff there. And so they did a bat. Um, they they did a social media check. You know, I had been volunteering there like two, three years, but that wasn't enough to vouch for my character. They needed to ask my space as well. That's how new social media was. We're talking wow. my space days. And so I had like a, a nice raunchy picture on there because we got tipsy one night and I did like a photo shoot in my underwear. And, and I was like, well, fuck it. I'm cute. I'm just going to put this on my MySpace page. So, <laughs> Uh, I judge no one for being vain in their 20s because fuck it. it. It is what it is. It is what fuck it is. And so and so they found this picture. So they called me into the office, the kids choir director and the adult choir director, because I was affiliated with the kids program in the adult choir because I sing and everything and stuff like that. And they were like, we found your photo. We can't believe what you've been doing. And they were they say they, we see you've been hanging out in Montrose, like in the gay district and. And they were like, you can't be doing that with them hanging out there with those people. And, <laughs> and so. Oh. And so, <laughs> and so. And yeah, this is Lakewood Church, Joel Osteen, Houston, Texas, largest mega church in the country. Oh, is that what that one is? Right. And I know. And it doesn't really matter that it was there because this sort of shit happens at churches of every size. Right. It's just the church where I happened to be at. If it was another church, I would have called them out. But I'm calling out the one that pertains to my story. And so they offered me a conversion therapy package. Oh, a, they, a package. They, <laughs> oh, well, well, fuck it. I mean, there's a conversion therapy package. I didn't realize that was a thing. They had pre-selected some books that they wanted me to read to become ungay. And they told me I would be fired from volunteering. I was a volunteer supervisor in the kids' life ministry and all of that. They told me I couldn't sing in the adult choir and the kids and nothing anymore, basically calling me a pedophile, saying I'm no longer, I mean, they don't trust me around their children. Uh, they said I could be demoted to be, I could be an usher or a greeter. And then once I'm not gay anymore, then maybe I could work my way back up into their graces. So just like ungay, <laughs> we're going to ungay you. Let me just get the, the ungay out of you. That's wild. Now, this is the same guy who basically robs people continually joel olstein that Some guy people, actually a lot of people do refer to him as you know you know a thief in that manner so that's how you choose I, to see him I, I, well i mean i i just look at his father who was nothing like like that and started that church and was very that wet like spreading the word in his way but even the mo the mother has come out and said that no like dad never planned on it being like this i mean so it's very interesting that they would do that to you because, again, one of the tenets of Christianity is judge not unless ye be judged. 
True, but there's there's what churches like that say to the public, and then there's what they do behind private. the scenes. Now, my first mistake when I was filling out the application to volunteer in Kids Life, they had on their in bold letters that like, if you're not if you are homosexual, that they do not want you around their children. They had that on the fucking application. Now, just getting out of the military, I'm thinking, okay, this is another one of those don't ask, don't tell situations. So I'm not trying to fuck any children. It's not like I'm Catholic or anything. And so <laughs> I'm just going to like, <laughs> oh God, so, you know, mark no to this and go and volunteer and do this good work. Like what I'm trying to do. Right. I mean, you know, I got plenty of grown up dick to take. I don't need anything from little Johnny. And so, but actually they take it quite seriously. And there are some people who just like you see going on in politics today, basically, if you're not straight, you're a pedophile. To Republicans, the people who are conservative, like the Osteens and stuff like that, they don't say that shit on the cover, but behind right. the, behind the scenes. And then when they were firing me from volunteering, man, they tell me I'm not the only one. They were like, we do this all the time. And then you have churches like that that are always bitching about not having enough volunteers. And I'm all like, well, bitch, stop firing them. <laughs> you don't have these issues. Wow. <laughs> so, I mean... And it's interesting. So, so you, at this point in your life, you've you've distanced yourself from from any organized religion at all, right? Because in the pandemic, helped me with this. I was like, you know what? It finally occurred to me that I actually grow more spiritually, and I feel closer to God when I'm alone. When I, I get was that. when I was spiritually immature, didn't realize I was. I used to think that the closest I felt to God was when I was in worship at a church. I used to think I had to go to church to really connect with him. But then as I grew, I outgrew churches, you know, and I think we all should. Church is nothing more than a school. It's a place you go to learn. So it's like college and all other things. You shouldn't be in school forever. Eventually, you should know how to approach God, how to worship him and praise him and to learn about him without a fucking preacher. You know, you don't you know, you shouldn't be in school forever. And so I don't think need him anymore. <laughs> Well, that was the whole thing. Why they say that uh, one of the law, I think it was one of the lost books of Peter was removed from the Bible during the Constantine Reformation was because he made a comment along those lines, like, "No, you could just anywhere you go, you're good," and that took away the idea of organized religion, going to a church, and all those kind of things. Uh, I'm just curious: Have you ever looked into anything like? Uh, and I don't know if this would fall into something that would even interest you. The Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence. <laughs> I'm aware those are the guys, girls, or whatever that run around mm -hmm. dressed like nuns. And yep, and I we've had we've had them on. We have fr I'm, I have friends that do that also. That's uh, I was just wondering if that was anything that you ever thought about, like All from right. an organ from an org not necessarily from a religious standpoint, but more of like where you said finding uh, uh, that group community kind of thing. Anything like that ever interest you? I don't know in detail about the, the Sweet Sisters. Every time I've been out and I've seen them, there's been a lot of alcohol and they were just partying their asses off. So I don't know what they actually do. They do a lot of charity work. They do a ton, a ton of charity work. That's that's their big thing is uh, a lot of charity work. But yeah, look, look, they, they, they know how to tip the elbow. Don't get that twisted. <laughs> don't get that twisted. So, so now you went through this your addiction, I mean, and you got into math. Like you, you didn't bullshit around. If you were going to do it. You're going to do it right. Well, I am a Sagittarius. <laughs> I, I, you're going to have to help me there. And I'm not sure who, uh, Brian, Brian glow light, light bright says bear country. Yep. Uh, it's out there, you know? So, um, so I'm just curious. So what was the awakening for you when you kind of said, I got to get away from this path. I've got to break this. From the church or from the meth? For, yeah. I mean, whatever me method is, a method is, I mean, but I mean, meth, method is, whatever one works for you, but. <laughs> you, he's not, he's not talking about the United Crystal Methodist Church. Yeah, that's, that's even better. That's even better. United Crystal Methodist Church. That's so great. <laughs> that, that, that's, that, that's a whole different UCC. <laughs> that's so great. I promise folks, I'm, this is just I'm not a horrible person. Please don't, <laughs> please don't come chasing me down. Um, because but you no. see, church, because you see, church can be just as much of an addiction as drugs. And when I look back on it, I think that I was addicted to them both about the same, both to my detriment. 
Now, do you, do you feel like you're just like, you know, I know you talked about getting into joining groups and being part of groups and all that, but do you feel like maybe you're the type of person that needs to dump their energy, whatever it is, good or bad for you in a personal level, you have to dump yourself into that? No, not anymore. Um, or at least maybe it's changed. So I don't go around seeking groups to be a part of, you know, I've channeled my energy into writing books and hosting my show, but a hell of a lot of yoga, especially yin yoga. What is yin? I, I like hot yoga. Yin yoga is a very still practice. Like you might only do five or six poses for the whole hour and you hold each pose a good like three to five minutes. Damn. See, I, I, I was having back problems when I first got out of the Marine Corps and hot yoga, one of the best things I ever did for my back. That and it was 9,000 degrees in the room. So I sweat out and not feel as much of a fat kid anymore. Mm -hmm. I wasn't, I wasn't running no more. Mm -mm. So, so what was, so what was the eye opener though, for you to say, Hey, I, I've got to, I've got to break this drug addiction. I would say it was kind of gradual, you know, SWAT kicking my door in and coming to drag me out with the canines and the face shields and the fucking auto semi-automatic rifles really didn't make me stop. Well, hold but on. Hold on. You don't get to gloss over that. You <laughs> don't get to gloss over SWAT and dogs and dragging you out by your... What the hell happened there? Well, I, I was selling a bit much narcotics and I was hanging out with like you know, and this strikes a lot of people as a surprise, but you like Aryan Nation and shit like that. Well, you know, Aryan Nation is not known to affiliate with blacks or gays. But I'm going to tell you one fucking thing. If you can make them money, there are people even within the Aryan Brotherhood who don't give a fuck about race and none of that as long as you can pull coin. Because I sold more crystal meth than, than all the white boys were in Houston in that time. And that really shocked a lot of people because I'm a good salesperson and a lot of military recruiters and I was an Air Force recruiter. It, it is known that military recruiters make great drug dealers. <laughs> so <laughs> I did that shit for 12 of my 20 years. I, I don't I don't know if I I just think about, I guess if shit don't work out with staffing, I guess I could go into selling dope, I guess. I mean, absolutely, you could. <laughs> and so, so I, you know, I, but like you were saying, I threw myself wholeheartedly into whatever. So be it volunteering at church, be it the military, if I'm going to sell fucking drugs, I had everything. My store was called Drugs or Us, and I had heroin, meth, crack, cocaine, um, all kinds of different ecstasy pills and uh, downers like your lower tails, Percocets, you know, all of that shit. I had needles, syringes, pipes, you know, I, weed. You were you full know, service. Full service, one stop shop, white glove service, all the way, you know. <laughs> and so <laughs> the people I was getting my, my meth from, though, that was the main thing. Now, look, I made more money selling crack and cocaine, but the meth, the tweakers are just so much more interesting and so dramatic. You know, <laughs> you know, you know, looking cocaine people, I show up to a very posh club, drop them off an eight ball party and VIP and keep going. You know, they weren't sketched out. I like the drama of the sketchiness. <laughs> and so, so I was I was selling enough attention to, to have them do a coordinated effort to try and pin me down. The people I was getting my meth from, they were moving about like two keys a day. Damn. And I was selling enough to get their attention and for them to respect me enough to have me in their private, you know, home and everything. And I was good friends with several meth cooks back in the day. And so um, I won't tell you any recipes and stuff. No, like thank that. you. I mean, I watch, Breaking, <laughs> I watch Breaking Bad. They've got it on there. Like, that's how I need. Just watch Breaking Bad. <laughs> right. Come on, Heisenberg. Yeah. And, you know, everything about Breaking Bad from beginning to end was 100 percent accurate. So I know they had some damn tweakers they consulted with for that show because that <laughs> shit was was right. The only thing is it wouldn't have taken five seasons for 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 all of that to happen. All of that would have happened in one fucking year. And so that's oh, really? that moves. But you know, I was selling a lot of fucking drugs and I was really flashy. I had a brand new 2010 white Mustang football leather interior and I was out at the clubs. I was too flashy to be a drug dealer, but I just I needed the attention. I needed the love. I needed it. I needed it. I couldn't stand being by myself. And so I was always surrounded by people and I just sold a bunch of it and they tried to get me a bunch of times and then I kept moving around and shit and they, and they finally pinned me down. They, they sent an informant in, you know, as they do. And, um, and that's how they were able to nab me. And so, yeah, they came in, knocked the door in. It had to be 2040 
fucking Cavalier vests, face shields, semi-automatic rifles, helicopters zooming around, the canines and everything. Oh, and shit. I think, I think the informant told them I was some Frank Lucas criminal, you know, murdering drug dealer, but really I was just a scared kid who lost his way. I didn't own guns. I hate guns. Um, always have. You know, I wasn't violent. I was just good at sales. <laughs> and so... <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, hey, look, you're honest. Look, I ain't trying to hurt nobody. I'm just trying to sell my shit. I sold a grown ass people shit that they wanted. I don't think that should have been illegal, but you know, whatever. They didn't sell to kids or anything like that. And so, um, and so, no, that was the first arrest. And then there was a couple, no, that was the second arrest. And then there was like some other ones, but the turning point came. I don't know, like after I got back here, because they had to transfer my probation from Louisiana, from Texas to Louisiana. And just over time, constantly getting into trouble and everything like that, it was like um, I kind of did a harm reduction on myself without realizing it. So what does that mean, harm reduction? Harm reduction is a form of recovery that's like speaks against, say, like the anonymous movement and all of that. So that means so like me. So I used to shoot up meth a few times a day. So now I'm in Louisiana where meth is harder to find. At least at that time, I didn't know where it is. I know where it's at now. So I was like, well, what can I get my hands on? Well, crack. Crack is not as intense as meth specifically. So I started doing crack instead of meth. And so then I started doing it less and less and less over the years. So harm reduction means you're either going to do the same drug that you're doing. You're going to give yourself permission to do the same drug that you're doing, but you're going to do it less. Are you going to switch to a less intense drug and also do it less as you begin to slowly step yourself down off of it? So if you smoke five packs of cigarettes a day, you're going to switch to three packs a day to eventually one pack a day to eventually a half a pack a day to eventually, you know, weaning yourself off. Right. So it was like you're putting yourself on an elongated detox, which involves a lot of drugs, but just less of them over time. I've never... That's a new one for me. And it is not so much that I decided. I could see that it wasn't working for me. Okay, so I'm, and my body was rejecting it. You know, it, it was tearing my stomach up. I couldn't rest well. So just logically, you know, I couldn't party with it because I had fucked around and got HIV, uh, which I found out I was HIV positive on a voicemail, like back in on a voicemail. Yeah, I had a really shitty doctor. So that you really think. Me Right. So then that threw me in like a, into a depression, but it also affected my anatomy so that I couldn't do those hard drugs anymore. And just party and just, you know, shoot up some meth or, or whatever, and just go out, out the door like, you know, now it's knocking me on my ass. So I have to learn how to stop. And so, you know, over time, you know, I just I just try to do it like, you know, less and less and less. I was in and out. You know, I went to rehab once. I fucking hated it. I studied Alcoholics Anonymous, Narcotics Anonymous, Crystal Meth Anonymous, you know, and I found those to be unacceptable programs because they're fear based and I rooted in fear. And I hated calling myself a fucking addict every time I stood up to talk. <laughs> and so. And, and Keith says, and Keith's a good buddy of mine. He's, he's in Kentucky. He says it's taking yourself out of the situation, like slowly working your way out of the situation. That was right. That was the strategy of moving me to Baton Rouge from Houston, because the probation officer was like, it's not very likely you're going to be successful if you stay here where all your drug connections and the dope boys are. So they moved me back to Louisiana, where I had my parents, you know, and stuff like that. Not that I didn't go back to Houston and get in trouble and had to run from the police and shit like that. You know, <laughs> <laughs> I did all of that. But the thing is, you know why I did? Because that was my community, you know. What you knew. And, you know, and I, went, and I ended up homeless and everything after the drug raid, too. So I had gotten accustomed to living on the streets. And so what I, what I realize now, what I didn't know then, like asking somebody to say, like, stop being homeless, to give up drugs is not. You're asking them to throw away the family they know, the community that they know, whether it's. I mean, it's no more dysfunctional than houses that are in fucking conservative neighborhoods. You got problems everywhere you go. But in a lot of those dope houses, you know, they took me in on cold nights when I couldn't go anywhere else. 
you know, they were their own version of code blue. They were, they were their own version of love. Oh, that's bro. That's deep. <laughs> so That's seriously deep. You understand that, right? Like that's, that's a level right there. You just went to that. You know, we, we all kind of associate the new Jack city drug dealer. Do you know what I mean? That, that ultra violent, you know, everything that, you know, it's just anger and nastiness and give me my money. We never would associate that there was its own form of love. And key key says that's, that's real talk, man. That, that really is. Um, I, and it's, I mean, I mean, you're, you're, you're getting into some, some deeper side of, of a lot of this. So how long have you been sober right now? I don't know what fucking month is this. I That's, don't. I don't know. I can't remember the last time. I probably fucked around with some shit maybe six months to a year ago. I stopped fooling with the whole time thing because that's that's the shit that they teach you in the anonymous movement and I feel like it's a trap because it makes it seem like your sobriety is relegated to a certain length of time rather than a decision to be sober. And so which creates anxiety about how long can I then maintain this sobriety and then should you fuck up and get high in however much time then every damn time I saw it happen, the person came down so hard on themselves and and then they would just go out and just start getting even more high because they felt so fucking guilty because of the pressure the programs put on you to maintain a certain um, a certain um, a certain length of time or as Keith is saying, count down till you fuck up again. And I don't like that because you know what? To me, I don't first of all, I don't think drugs are bad. It just if you decided that they're too much for you, then that's you. But if if you were sober for a month or a week or a year or 10 years and then you go out and get high, I don't feel like you just lost that month or week or 10 years. You have one fucking high day and then that's it. There's no need to get all dramatic and cry and go running off. But if you built up this expectation and this fear, like they tell you in those programs, like if you get uh, high, you're going to lose everything. You know, and, you know, they try to scare you into staying sober. So what I did after I was a year and a half sober one time, I went out and got high, like intentionally just to see if what they were saying was true, because I got angry at the anonymous program for telling me what I could never be able to do. I'm like, bitch, don't tell me that I that I that I have to be an addict forever. You know, so I was like, let me see if I go get high, if I'm going to really lose everything like they said. And no, I didn't. And I'm not suggesting people go and do it because right. I, I did that shit out of rebellion against them because I realized that this program is trying to limit me and control me. And I also found it to be quite hypocritical because you want to be a spiritually based program where everyone can believe in a different God. I can worship the fucking chair if I want to or the fucking <laughs> rose bush outside myself, you, the group, whatever. Well, if I believe in the Trinity, which I do, how are you going to tell me? that God doesn't have power to heal me of being an addict. Like, why can't he do that? You know, why do I have to be an addict forever? You know, nobody could give me an acceptable answer on that. And so I told him to kiss my ass. <laughs> so <laughs> I love your approach, brother. Um, See, and you, you, I'm gonna have to tell you something. I mean this with a lot of love. You ruined one of my good questions about Houston because I want to go to Houston. But you ruined one of mine because now I'm like, I can't go to Houston. My, my man says, you know what? We can't go to Houston right now because I want to eat Viet Cajun. But I can't ask you about that in Houston. So you you get to this point. You're you're now in Baton Rouge. You're 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 getting your act together. How do we get started on the podcast? And let's not forget, because I'm gonna switch it up here because everybody's seeing the scroller sex drug and jesus.com. Make sure you go check that out. You check out uh, Devannon's uh, podcast, Sex, Drug, and Jesus podcast. Make sure you you, you get into that. But I want to uh, I want to also mention you even dumped your energy into a clothing line. Where does the clothing line and the podcast and, and all that kind of come together? Uh, Brian Glose has been clean since 11 4 2016 Hard as hell, but came out the other end. Brother, this is for you. Congratulations, Brian. That, that, that's good stuff, brother. 
you know, keep keep doing you. Um, so what is now, now you're on the other side of this. Um, brother, your story is amazing. I, and now I know why you wrote a book. Now I know why. I mean, because I don't know. I don't know if in my life, because I've had to deal with telling someone that they were HIV positive because I was a MEPS liaison when I when I was in the Marine Corps as a recruiter. And that's a that's a that's a whole nother thing when the doc calls you up and the CO calls you up and goes, call your CO, call the recruiter for this kid. We need him back here immediately. And you go, what's going on? And they go, don't worry about it. Get him in here. And that, you know it instantly because of the work I did. We got to, I know what what's going on. And you call that recruiter and you're like, hey, get your kid up here. And they're like, why? Shut the, get your kid up here. And I had to tell an 18 year old that like, this is the deal. Senior in high school. That this is the deal. I mean, and your attitude is amazing. Your just your positive outlook on life, um, to to get to the point you are, and to be able to show everyone like, don't be don't be a punk. You you can get on the other side of it. You can be positive. You can do things. And then you started a podcast that you're trying to compete with me. So I need you to go ahead and close your podcast down because I don't <laughs> want nobody hearing you talk because of all this great message you got here. I don't want them to hear you. Then ain't gonna want to listen to me. <laughs> so that's not we can't have that but you got your podcast tell everybody a little bit about it my podcast is my spoken testimony so instead of standing up in church on a sunday morning and speaking about the deliverances that god wrought into my life the podcast is more permanent what do you mean so, so rather than speaking to a congregation or whatever because once the Lord has done something, you know, it's good to say so. But see, a podcast can reach the entire world. And once I die, those messages can still be here. So my podcast is like my living testimony, which is also ever evolving. So now is it just you talking or do you bring guests on? What's your, what's the, what can people expect by listening to your show? We're in the like around episode 53 now. And so far, it's been me interviewing other people. I will start doing some solo episodes very, very soon. But so it's not just my story. It's other people's stories, too. I wanted the contrast there. But now that we are, you know, a permanent show and, you know, most podcasts don't make it past like the first 10 episodes. 10 episodes. That's the magic number. And so now that it's looking like we're going to stick around a while, you know, I'm going to start doing some solo ones. But you know, and, you know, I hope to reach people and to be to be transparent and vulnerable through every medium that I can. So the books, the show, you know, whatever else I can get my hands on. Now, you 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 definitely come off the van as somebody who has no problem in in telling their story. But when you got that mic in front of you and you got to this medium here, was it more of a challenge or did it feel like? Uh, an old friend that you were getting ready to do with, have a conversation with. How did that, how did that manifest for you? If you're asking me that I have a problem like hosting and stuff like that, not necessarily I hosting, but telling, telling your story over the mic and kind of speaking out into the ether that way and, and, and getting involved with it that way. Did that, well, did that seem like a challenge or did it feel like a natural thing at, that you like, no, I got this. We're good. Yeah. Look, when you lived on the streets and had to go through all the things that I have to try to re rehabilitate my life and, uh, you know, the things that happened to me in Houston, going from making 70000 a year to being homeless in the same city, you know, everything that happened to me was very public. So whatever pride that I had was dissolved back then. And, you know, and I'm no fool. I understood that the situations that I was in, most people would have died in any ordinary person, the dangerous situations that I let myself get in. So I understood that my destiny is to tell this story. It's the only reason I've been left alive, you know, is to reach people. So I don't have any fear. There's no trepidation left and there's no ego. That's amazing, brother. I mean, just you, you really you have an ama amazing story here. So how often does the show come out? 
We drop episodes every Thursday. Okay, so that's good. It's Thursdays, not Wednesday. It's good. I don't want you. I don't want you on Wednesdays. <laughs> Stay away from Wednesdays. That's me. <laughs> so, so fifty-three episodes every Thursday. Uh, is there a format? Is it? Do you have a format like this where people can watch it live as it's going on, or is it just the recorded episodes? It's recorded. Um, some of the episodes are released on YouTube on Thursday, so you can see it. But in terms of this, where you can come in and chat and stuff like that, no, nope, not yet. I hadn't made it to that part yet. But who you knows? Thinking about it? You, you, you considering it? I'm thinking about it. I'm thinking about it. But, you know, I need, I already have like an assistant, but I need like another one to do some of this because, you know, I'm always writing books, writing blogs, I write music. You know, I have so much other different, then I'm running my retail store, you know, so that's like five businesses. <laughs> so, you're a busy man now now you mentioned the retail store so you have a clothing line also down under apparel.com which if you anyone who knows me knows i cannot spell it took us five times of him trying to spell the word apparel to me because i was like no nah, it's apparel that's how you spell that nope missed the letter nope put that letter back put it over. i'm such a horrible speller <laughs> uh, i was the kid that my my teacher my english teacher this happened she was like do not disrupt the class and you can have a c Roger, sounds like a plan to me. So I just didn't disrupt the class. I could pass. So now the clothing line, the apparel, the down under apparel.com, is it stuff that you're making or is that um, you're just retailing other people's stuff? What, what's that about? Down under apparel is my heart. That business is almost 10 years old and is the first legitimate business I had after being a drug dealer. <laughs> <laughs> However, it is well connected to kind of sort of my meth days because, you know, when you're on meth, you're like very horny and super thin. So you're always running. Really? You're always that running. does? Yeah, well, each person is different, but 90% of the time you do meth and you just want to fuck everything. And so. Really? I never. <laughs> oh, yeah. And so, um, and so, you know, so I was very thin and so I had all these underwear and I just racked up an underwear collection and I discovered my underwear fetish. And then I would think in those days, hmm, this would be a great business. But I never did it because I was making enough money working for the light company, Centerpoint Energy in Houston, Texas. So, But having moved back here, I was hard to get a job because I had like three, four felonies. So I had to start being a janitor at the VA. You know, then I went up to being a food delivery driver, restaurants. Then I went back to school to become a massage therapist and open a massage therapy business. But while I was a janitor, I was like, fuck all this. And so I went to a flea market, rented a booth, ordered some underwear. And that's how I started down under apparel. And so now we're online and I do have some designs on there under my own brand. So it's both. I sell designs for, uh, from other people and my own. That way I provide a sufficient variety to my customers. But now we ship all over the world and we have products on every continent except Antarctica. Well, that's just because you got to have fur lined on these then. I mean, <laughs> yeah, they got to be fur lined. And Keith wants to know, taxes are weird, right? You, you got to do your own taxes and everything now. And drugs, you don't have to pay any taxes on. That's, a, you know, another, that's really the problem the government has with it. You ain't pay no taxes on that shit. So they just want it all. Right. Yeah. So you do. Yeah. There's the shitload of taxes and paperwork and everything. And, you know, but you you get taxed even as a drug dealer in the sense, you know, the way some of the suppliers overcharge you. And every time you get arrested, all the fucking fees you have to pay. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> I haven't laughed this hard in a long time. Brother, the, the way that you're like, no, 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 there was taxes. Let me explain to you how the tax was. They just weren't the shit you were used to. That's so great. So so we've got. Anybody can, but we can all go in. So it's it's straight just draws on Down Under Apparel, right? Down Under Apparel has everything you need to get freaky deaky, cock rings, thongs. Um, there's there's lace lingerie for men. There's dresses for women. There's workout gear for men and women. But it's a lot of boxers, boxers briefs, tanks tops, tank tops, lounge wear, you know, and stuff like that. Yeah. You got to get your ass up to P Town or one of those spots now, man. You know, re really get get a chance to blow up. You ever been to P Town? Come about Philadelphia? No, Provincetown, Rhode yeah. Island. Okay, no, Massachusetts. Massachusetts. Sorry, that, that's no. that's. Put it this way, P Town is what Key West wishes it was. Mm -hmm. 
I've yeah. heard of it. I've heard of it. Is that near like Fire Island or anything like that? Uh, no, not near Fire Island. It's this is, you know, the Cape looks like a fishing hook. If you ever see the Cape, it looks like a fish hook. Uh, this is actually Provincetown is actually the first place that the pilgrims landed at. And then they were like, oh, this doesn't work. We got to move on to somewhere else. But yeah, that's Provincetown. I have to take a second look to catch the fish hook uh, yeah. reference. I hope to spend more time on the East Coast. We're supposed to be going to Boston for the first time. Nice. Soon. So you're okay to leave the state now. All that stuff's done. It's all behind you. Yeah, I finished my probation early. They they gave me like seven years years of probation. So you're not on papers at all. No, I haven't been on papers for a long ass time. See, I told you, I know a little something. I, that's just called being on papers. When you know, you know. Yeah, you got to go up to the probation office every week, you know, to fill out the form. You got to pay them a monthly fee. Don't you love uh, that? You got to pay. You got to pay because you're in trouble. Mm -hmm. Then you got to pay the original court fees too. Shit, I think I paid them a monthly fee. All I know is this shit costs a lot of fucking money. And no, I couldn't leave. <laughs> I couldn't leave the state without asking permission. So it's like you're not really free. I, I've I've always stood by like look, you get in trouble, you go to jail, you get done. We tell our children, it, you know, you go to timeout. You know, kid goes to timeout. When they get done, they tell you, well, don't hold that over the kid's head anymore because they're never gonna gonna learn from it and they're never gonna progress because you're just constantly holding it over their head. We tell that as parents, but for some reason, we can't get that through our heads in the legal system. That somebody made a mistake, they've tried to get better from that mistake. We're going to hold that over your head. Like you said, three, four felons couldn't get a job. So what do you expect the person to do to improve themselves? If I can't get a regular job, I can't do the things that I need to do to improve my situation. Oh, usually you go back to selling drugs, which I exactly. try to do. Um, so recidivism is real. I couldn't even volunteer at one of our museums here because of the felonies. They didn't even want me as a volunteer because of the felonies. I guess they thought I was going to walk off with some a, shit. A mummy? Going to walk out with a mummy? Fucking no, but... Um, it's, it's amazing to me. I mean, is there anything that, that you learned throughout this that, you know, obviously we could sit here and say, oh, is there something you wish you wouldn't have done? Yeah, not get caught. Uh, you know, that's... That is what it is. But what type of things, is there anything that you would say to yourself, you know, if you had that that crystal ball, you know, that an eye opener that you think might have put you, maybe not have changed your path, but maybe you've improved where you're going? Does that make sense? That's how stupid way I asked it. I'll, I'll answer that like as a hypothetical. Right. However, because, however, once you read through like my, book or listen to the audio book, which I narrated myself, the dreams that I put in there that I had at different stages of life speak to this, that, that dark time. And, the, and I had to go through it in order to, to minister the way I do now. So it was unavoidable, kind of like Joseph having to go to jail before he could rule Egypt, so to speak. So or asking him, what could he have done different? Not trust his jealous ass brothers. I'm talking about Joseph, the dreamer from the Bible. So, so hypothetically speaking, I would have told myself, you know, don't you're not straight. So don't ever step foot in a church that doesn't celebrate who you are. No matter what your family told you to do or what your culture is, you non-straight person do not go to a church where they don't celebrate you because you're only hurting yourself. I would probably have told myself not to go to a military that doesn't celebrate you because, again, you're only hurting yourself. And, um, you know. And then that cr that creates trauma and shit like that, which then led to a lot of other de bad decisions because the original trauma wasn't healed. You know, so us non-straight folks constantly put ourselves in these situations where we're marginalized and people don't really like us, but they still deal with us. You know, that's bad energy to be around. I would you agree know? with that. Yeah. So, and I like something you said. You you minister it. You minister the way you are today. Mm -hmm. Are you mentoring others now? Because that's when I think of ministering someone, you're mentoring others. Have you gotten to a point where now you can mentor others and you're working with others that maybe have been in similar situations? 
when I say the word minister, a minister is nothing more than somebody who speaks what they feel like God is telling them to speak in whatever way that is. My ministry has nothing to do with a physical church or having a group of people specifically to speak to. My ministry is to the world. And so, um, so that means that I am telling my message through all the means that I have, the, music, the podcast and everything like that. The, the fieriness behind it comes through that which I have been through, which makes my ministry and my ability to reach people more potent. We're ministering to people now. You know, you don't need a fucking cool pit or a fancy suit or a congregation to be a minister of God or of the word or to preach a message somebody can use. Those things are completely unnecessary for ministry means you're supposed to give people something practical that they can fucking use, which has nothing to do with all the embellishments that seem to be have to do with Christianity these days. Those things are not necessary. You are absolutely right about that. You know, it, it's, you, you are a breath of fresh air, my friend. I, I have to tell you, you really, you really are. I mean, your, your approach, you could really be a bitter, nasty SOB, 100%. You, you could blame everybody else and everything under the sun. And I get this vibe like you've taken it with a grain of salt and said, no, I'm going to go be better than that. No, nope, let me go be better. And, and it, it, it's pretty impressive. I wouldn't say I, I appreciate that, man. I wouldn't say I took it with a girl. I mean, if it was a grain of salt, it was a huge, bitter <laughs> ass grain of salt. Big, big, nasty, dead, dead sea flake. Yes, that I struggled with for years. And I was pissed off and angry at that doctor who left that HIV diagnosis. At like, that's incredible to me. Like, so he just was like, just want to give you a call. You got HIV. Oh, Have a nice he day. Was just fucked up because I had fucked around. Yeah, I was a hoe and I got all these diseases, shit, fuck it, it was what it was. I enjoy riding dick. And so I fucked around and I got like hepatitis B first. And so I found that out donating blood. They sent me a letter saying, don't bring us your blood anymore because it's filthy, you got hepatitis B. And so now I'm at the liver doctor trying to deal with the hepatitis B, then he finds the HIV. And he didn't tell my primary care doctor, the liver doctor is a specialist. Right. He's not my primary care. That bitch should have told my primary care doctor. And he held those results for a month. And we were trying to find out, but he wouldn't tell us. So now it's New Year's Eve. I got all my drugs laid out, all my dope and shit. About to turn the fuck up. You know, and he's calling me. It's a Saturday. His office ain't even supposed to be open. I'm like, why are you calling me, leaving me voicemails? And I'm trying to party. And I'm like high on everything I can get my hands on. And I check this fucking voicemail. I just didn't want to bring in the new year. I didn't want to be a, a coward. I was like, let me just see. And he's all like, yeah, you're HIV positive. Don't be out there spreading this shit around to people and coming to the office when you can. And so I never did because I totally freaked out. And, and I just thought I was going to like fucking die because everyone I ever knew who had HIV or AIDS did die. I didn't know anyone that I was in constant communication with who had HIV. And so <laughs> like, like, like. <laughs> like that's the most nonchalant message you could leave for something like like yeah you got it don't spread it but stop see, by the office when you get a chance but see this, New is Year. Why, this is why i don't fuck with doctors anymore i only see nurse practitioners they have the same head knowledge and prescribing power as doctors the only thing is they have a heart and they have a soul um I don't deal with doctors. You know, I need that nurse's touch. So a nurse practitioner can treat you the same as a doctor can, but they're going to actually love you and show you affection. And those mean ass doctors won't. And when you complain against those doctors, like the Texas Medical Board, what they do is they surround the doctor and they shield them. They don't give a fuck what damage that doctor has caused. He's too valuable to them. They're like, oh, no, 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 no. It can't be that bad. Wow. I, well, Texas is a whole nother thing in and of itself right now. They, we, we, I ain't even gonna get into Texas. I ain't gonna get into Texas. Like Texas is that whole thing where they, everybody's like, go home, you're drunk. It's like, Texas, go home, you're drunk. I, I can't. I don't know what's going on down there. Um, that's a whole nother animal. So we're going to get ready. We're going to get ready to close the bar up here, brother. But uh, who's who's your next guest? Anybody that we can be looking forward to tomorrow to listen to? Who did I? My tomorrow's episode is going to be a woman by the name of Heather Wild. 
and she um, she just released a book about entrepreneurship and the pitfalls that people fall into with like sketchy business coaches and things like that. And so, so we spend time kind of going through the book and talking about sketchy shit and we swap cocaine stories because she used to be in like the um adult services and she has stories about how people used to do lines of cocaine off of her body and everything <laughs> so- <laughs> where see this is what 20 years in the marine corps i'm listening to these stories and i'm like i missed out like where was i'm not trying to do no blow right now but damn i missed out on some shit <laughs> Oh, Nathan, my favorite, my favorite comfort food is seafood. Any kind of lobster, crawfish, Ooh. crabs, scrimps. Scrimp, yeah. It, it, that's it. I love. Ugh. We just had uh, Argentinian shrimp uh, tonight. I started our grocery store started carrying those. They're like big shrimp too. I mm-hmm. like. Them. But I'm a see. So Nate's from Baltimore, like myself. So we're big uh, steamed blue crab fans. Got to be steamed. Don't boil my crabs. You, you will get kicked out of the house. You will never be allowed back again. They must be steamed. All seafood must be steamed. Steamed what, works. What? Anything but fried. See, I'm the same way. I'm not a fried seafood fan at all. Like, I just can't mess with it. It just, I, I always feel like whenever someplace gives me like fried seafood, I will say, I, I'll take it back. I've had some good fried catfish before. I've had some decent fried catfish. But I always feel like whenever somebody fries your fish, it always ends up like, uh, more breading than fish and it like the fish shrinks and it's like a hollow case around it. You know what I mean? It's horrible. Uh, Nate says boiling is wrong. You're absolutely right. Like if you like to boil your seafood, this is not the show for you in any way, shape or form. I just can't, I can't mess with you at all. So we have Miss Heather Wild coming on tomorrow. Um, the book name, we you never, never dropped the book name. My book name or her book name? Your book name. I don't care about her book name. I care about you. Yeah, my uh, book name is Sex, Drugs, and Jesus. It's the same as the podcast. Same as everything else, Sex, Drugs, and Jesus? Yep. Where's it at? Bring it up here. Put it on the screen. That's a great... Who did your cover art? This guy who lives in Greece. And I met him through 99designs.com. And I recommend everybody go there when they're ready to get a book design, a postcard design, a CD cover design, or music, artwork, whatever the fuck you need. It's a great website. Dude, that cover is badass. For those that aren't looking at it, it's a it's a skull with bars for eyes, a crow sitting on top of him. Is that flames around the around it or is it in sand? Smoke. Oh, smoke. Meth, so that, smoke. <laughs> meth smoke around the skull. And then the word sex and Jesus are in red and drugs are in white. Amazon, everywhere you can find it. Yeah, on my website, there's a universal book link for people who hate Amazon. There's it's like everywhere. And the crow's also holding a syringe with blood in it. Oh, I could, I could, I couldn't tell that. So that's perfect, brother. Dude, that's badass. That's a badass cover right there. I've seen a lot of good book covers. Yeah, which I'll tell you where most of the stuff that you've got, the naming of it and the imagery makes you want to go check it out. Whether you're into it or not, it just makes you want to go. Like, what the hell is that over there? Well, so I give you a lot of credit there. You know how to market it. Look, that's a that's a good drug dealer life. You know how to market that shit. <laughs> that, let me show you how to market these drugs right here. Go ahead and get you good and high right now, son. Come on over by here. Go ahead and take a little puff of this meth right here. Shoot up a little bit. Uh, no problem. Feel good and high, don't you? <laughs> and they always come back for more. Oh, no, no. The first one's on me. You'll like it. Come on back and see me. Yep. Get them on and come back. Oh, shit. That's wild, bro. Like, you, I, I'm impressed. Uh, such a great conversation, brother. You are welcome at the bar anytime you would like. Um, we're not doing bumps off my bar. I'm going to, yeah, there's a bathroom if you need to do that, but you ain't doing bumps off the bar. Nothing personal. <laughs> <laughs> People are like, what the fuck is going on over there? It's lost its mind, but we, we appreciate you. So Thursdays, five P or Thursdays is when your show drops. Uh, we've got Heather wild this week. Fifth, this will be episode 53 or 54 coming out. We've got the book, Sex, Sex, Drugs, and Jesus. I almost said rock and roll. So Sex, Drugs, and Jesus. We've got the book that you can check out, the podcast by the same name. We're going to check out uh, Down Under Apparel. Make sure you spell apparel right and you're not like me. It's A-P-P-A-R-E-L. Don't be illiterate like your host. I can't spell. It's all right. I switch out T, T's and D's in the way I speak Baltimore. There's no T in that word. Uh, make sure you check out downunderapparel.com. 
any other things you got going you want everybody to check out? You got any appearances, lives, anything going on? No, just stay tuned. There's two other books that I'm working on. Um, one's called Don't Call Me a Christian, which gives my views on the current clusterfuck that is Christianity. It will be a free book, although I'm writing it just as intensely as I did this one. I just feel like I shouldn't make people pay for that. And then the next one is a, next one is a poetry book. And why not? Why not charge for that book? Because the, Don't Call Me a Christian is a book that is the core of why I'm doing what I'm doing, which is to encourage people to have a spiritual identity and to be serious about their spiritual walk and not to be casual with it. And so so winning souls, whatever you want to call it, you know, God is at the center of everything. And so this book is centered around my thoughts on that. And people will take free shit and some people won't spend a penny on some things. I don't judge them for being cheap. You know, maybe they really just don't have it too. Maybe they don't have a penny. I've been there before, you know, not having a penny. And so I think it's appropriate to just give it away. I don't believe in charging for everything. Well, when you got it done, make sure you share it onto the Above the Bar podcast, Facebook page and all of our stuff. You are welcome to, to share your links with us so that everybody gets to, to see it. Spread spread that word. I mean, you're 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 doing the Lord's work. I mean, let's call it what it is, brother. I mean, I'm, I'm very, very impressed by all of it. This is, see, people always ask me, why, why don't you research your guests beforehand? Because I want to enjoy this shit as much as everybody else. How the hell am I supposed to know it if I already know everything? Like, hey, man, I read this. Is that true? I read that, too. Is that true? Yes, I already know all this shit. Why am I talking to you? Mm-hmm. This is more fun. And I know you thought I was just some crazy, crazy ass white dude with a big giant beard. I know you did. Now, now you just know I'm just a guy with a beard. Crazy as white dudes have been my biggest supporters over the years. So. <laughs> <laughs> my chair fell down as I laughed so hard. <laughs> All right, brother. Do not log off. We're going to get ready to close this up. I need to talk to you for a couple of moments afterwards. As we do on every single one of the episodes, we got to do this. Uh, let me remind everybody real quick before I forget. Look, for everybody who's out there listening to us and enjoying, make sure you follow, like, subscribe, share. Take your neighbor's phone out out of their hand. Go through their podcast. Put this on their phone. They'll love you for taking it out of their hand. They'll appreciate it. Uh, if you're riding the bus, take the phone out of the person on the bus's hand. They like that too. Just like snatch it out of their hand and be like, shut up, putting this on your phone. Make sure they're all following the Above the Bar podcast. Also, make sure you uh, you follow us on YouTube, trying to get that YouTube thing bounced up. We have a TikTok, the Above the Bar podcast. We have an Instagram, the Above the Bar podcast. I'm on everything. Just look. You can see this face anywhere you want to. Uh, this will drop tomorrow morning at, make sure all your people know, this will be tomorrow morning at 7 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. This will all hit hit the waves. But as we do on every single episode, the guest gets the final word. So from you, brother man, what is the final word? Hmm. The final word is to be true to yourself. And as you're considering spiritual paths, you know, whatever it may be, you know, just to be all in. Uh, I'm I'm pro Trinity and I love that, you know, I'm different. You know, I'm not like, you know, a conservative Christian person. You know, there's all kinds of ways to follow Christ and there, you know, and you can do it and very much be yourself. But whatever, be Buddhist or whatever, just don't be casual about it. Be just as serious in your pursuits of spirituality as you are in money, sex, dick, ass, or whatever it is that you like. And amen and amen. All righty, folks. Be sure to push your stool in. This has been an Earplug Podcast presentation. Found on EarplugPodcast.com, iTunes, SoundCloud, and wherever your favorite podcasts are found.